You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, world, and welcome to the Common Descent Podcast. This is episode 154. On this podcast, we talk about paleontology, evolution, life history, and the like. This episode's topic is viviparity. What's that? A process known to its friends as live birth. Yeah. Giving birth to live young. We did an episode about eggs Mm -hmm. a while ago, episode 92, where we talked about eggs and the creatures that lay them. This episode, we're talking about the other side of that coin, which is not a two-sided coin. (laughs) Live birth. Giving birth instead of laying eggs, giving birth to live young. This is a thing that lots of animals do. It is more common than, probably more common than you think it is. It's more common than I thought it was. Yeah, no, (laughs) this gets portrayed very often as like, and mammals do it, and then that's the end of it. Everyone else lays (laughs) eggs. This is going to be a fun discussion because not only are we going to get to talk about the diversity of live bearing biology, the history of it, what we know about the evolution of the the behavior, what we see in the fossil record, but also we're going to get to knock out a couple of probably misconceptions about this and just sort of how it, where it falls in the animal tree of life. And I'm always excited when we get to debunk some myths. We might debunk some myths today. It's going to be pretty cool. Now, we're excited to do that, and we're also excited that this episode was requested. This topic comes requested to us by Matthew, Altea, Jackie, Scott, and Milu. Thanks for the requests. Thank you, everybody. We hope you enjoy the episode as much as we are sure to enjoy the episode. (laughs) Hey, before we get into the main meat of the episode, some quick announcements. Number one, as always, we have a Patreon. We sure do. The podcast is supported, everything we do, supported by the donations and engagement that we get on Patreon. Our patrons allow us to do all of our science education endeavors that we do through the podcast. Patrons get all sorts of cool goodies like access to bonus content, bonus news, uh, bonus noise. (laughs) And at a certain level, if you sign up on Patreon, we will say your name right here, right from our mouths. (laughs) This episode, we would like to welcome new patrons, Eric, Lily, and Bill. Welcome and thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hey, if you, yeah, you, dear listener, would like to support the podcast, you can join us on Patreon, or you can make a one-time donation, or you can send us physical mail to our mailing address, or you can follow us on social media or join the Discord, or you can sign up on Audible using our (laughs) Audible link. Head down to the episode description and you will find all sorts of different ways you can engage and support us. And we thank you for it. Hey, speaking of people sending us stuff, sometimes we get stuff sent to us. We recently got a letter from Ollie. Yeah. uh, Who said a bunch of nice things and then also gave us a bunch of episode requests. (laughs) So thank you for that. We love getting mail. It's it's very touching to hear... New a- a- actual experiences and, and opinions from our listeners. It's very cool. Yes. Hey, it is almost the very end of the year. There is one episode left after this one, an alley episode, uh, yeah. which means plants, which comes out on Christmas. So that is our <laughs> Christmas episode. Hope you've all been good. <laughs> and our end of the year Q&A, which will come out right at the end of the year. Every year, we collect a bunch of questions from our audience and then just spend a few hours in one major recording answers. Just a big mailbag episode. Absolutely. Answering questions. The question submission form is live until December 15th, which means when this episode comes out, there are still a few days left. If you haven't submitted your question for the end of the year Q&A, the link will be in the episode description. Get on it quick before time is up. Yes, if you're listening to this announcement and thinking of a question to ask right now, go click that link. Get, click the <laughs> Pause the episode, click the link, and then please come back and listen to the episode. It's going to be yes, great. Yes, we are excited to see what you all want us to say. And that will be the last thing of the year. And this is the last thing of the announcements. Excellent. Which means it's time for the news. Every episode, we like to gather up some news from paleontology and related subjects to keep us up to date, keep you up to date, and do a little bit of delving into the scientific process, exploring the leading edge of our favorite sciences. Will, what's on the edge? 
currently a new fossil of an army ant. Oh, hey, that's cool. Yes, this is a a big deal for ant research. (laughs) This research is by Christine Sociak et al. in Biology Letters, and the article is by Furman Koop in ZME Science. Hey, if you head to the blog post for this episode, you'll find links to the news articles. So, army ants, we talked a bunch about them in the ants episode. Episode 149. So if you want more details, go there. But these are famously known ants, in uh, often in the group Dorillinae, which form huge societies and are famous for some key characteristics among social insects, but ants particularly. These including things like them being nomadic, they don't make a nest, they just move from place to place. They are predatory, which is not unique to them, but they do mass predation Mm -hmm. raids across the forest floor usually is where you find them. Wingless queens, which is unique to them. All of these traits together make up what's called the army ant syndrome. Multiple species have come to this type of behavior and way of life separately, but our knowledge of their history is not as complete Molecular evidence suggests that the syndrome evolved twice during the mid-Cenozoic, so not too long ago, once in the Neotropics and once in the Afrotropics, so Africa and the Americas, which there has been some debate on. We talked about that in the ants episode, but the fossil record for army ants is very scarce. There's not a lot of fossils of army ants, but according to these reports, there's only really one known specimen that's been identified as army ant from the Caribbean 16 million years ago. So that's really the only army ant fossil we have. This fossil is a new species that has, seems to be an army ant. Ooh, army ant number two. Yeah. This species has been named Dissimular Doralis Perseus. It was preserved in Baltic amber and dates to the Eocene about 35 million years old. Oh, so this one is twice as old as the former only fossil army ant. Exactly. Which makes it the oldest army ant we know of. Mm -hmm. And the first from the Eastern Hemisphere. Oh, cool. This is about a three millimeter long. I think they were saying the fossil was three millimeters long. Uh, I don't know whether that was the ant or the fossil, but... Or the chunk of amber that it's in. (laughs) But it's small. It's itty bitty. (laughs) Uh, It is an eyeless ant. Oh. So it is blind, which is not uncommon for army ants. There's a number of species that have reduced eyes or no eyes, which is part of the reason it got its name Perseus, who defeated the Gorgon by blocking his sight. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ha, Greek mythology. Right? (laughs) (laughs) This fossil has been interesting for a number of reasons. Not only is it extended our age range, you know, our our fossil evidence of army ants by, you know, 100%, and increased the age that we now know them from, but it also is the first evidence from Europe, which... There right. are no army ants in Europe currently. Oh, so like today, there's no modern day yeah, army ants. We there. don't have existing army ants in Europe, but this shows that they were in Europe. Cool. They were able to identify it as army ant using a combined morphological and molecular data set. So it fell out. It had the affinities to put it within Dorillus, which is the army ant group. And they noted that the age that this fossil was dated to, Europe would have been much hotter and wetter which would have made it a more ideal army ant environment. Right. Better for army ants than today. Exactly. We tend to find army ants in warm climates. Uh, You just don't, you know, there's ants that range into colder areas. Army ants don't tend to do that. Right. Like you said, tropics today. Yes. So it's likely that Europe was friendly to army ants and had army ants, but as it's gone through multiple cooling cycles, it has become inhospitable inhospitable to them. That makes sense. But were the army ants friendly to Europe? Right. <laughs> they found an uh, one feature on the ant that was that they noted which was an enlarged antibiotic gland. This is found in other army ants and it helps them in living underground. When they're living in that tight community, disease can spread very quickly, so ants have ways to thin that off, you mm-hmm. know, to fight disease. So this suggests that this ant was likely from a subterranean species. Oh, cool. One that was occupying underground areas. That's awesome. It has a space for a gland that we see in subterranean ants that they use to fight off bacteria. Yes. Awesome. Which they said means this is a particularly lucky find since 
subterranean insects don't often encounter amber. Yeah, they're, they're not usually on trees. So if this is indeed uh, what this gland suggests, that they would be living underground, we're super lucky that we found this at all. And they noted that it's likely a worker. So this is li- was likely a worker ant, not one of the warrior ants with larger jaws. So one of the smaller variety. Yeah, maybe this was an ant who was kicked out of the colony because of his all all of his wacky inventive ideas <laughs> yes. so he went wandering by himself <laughs> making friends with other kinds of bugs absolutely getting caught in amber uh and the workers will go on those raids they will participate so it absolutely could have been a raider uh but i think the inventive ant is <laughs> i think that makes the most compelling. sense yeah that's... yeah that's that's the documentary i'd want to watch about a 90 minute long story <laughs> Maybe this is just the bias. We've admitted here on the podcast that we have a bias towards vertebrate animals. Mostly we end up talking about vertebrates, mammals and reptiles, sometimes even fish and amphibians. (laughs) But So maybe it's just that talking. But it is always exciting when we discover cool invertebrate fossils. Yes. Just because they feel... I know, I'm a paleontologist, I know that most of the fossil record is invertebrates. But it always still feels a little bit wrong. Like we shouldn't get an ant fossil. Yep. Even though we talked in the ant episodes that there's tons of ant fossils. Yes. It's always just like a little piece of treasure to go, this what what are the odds? This lucky little find of a tiny little ant and some resin. Which also, because some of these are very rare, means that every time we find one, it's something new. Absolutely. Well, I feel like it's the same feeling that we have toward living ants sometimes. It's just how does something that small function Mm -hmm. how are you doing all the stuff that other animals do when you're that tiny so the idea that something that tiny could survive for millions of years in the fossil record is astounding yeah well that's very neat hey i've got a piece of news that is also a new species that is the oldest of the things that it is cool this one is a lizard this is research in science advances by David Whiteside et al., and we will link to a news report by James Ashworth on the website of the Natural History Museum, which is the museum where the people who publish the study work. Lizards belong to a group of reptiles called squamates, which is all lizards, including snakes. And as we've talked about before, there are plenty of squamate fossils, but early squamate evolution is not very well understood. The oldest well known lizard fossils are from the middle to late Jurassic period, so 150, 170 million years old. But there's a bunch of evidence that suggests that lizards probably got started quite a bit earlier than that. Yeah. Uh, DNA studies, where we estimate the origination of groups, suggest that they probably predict they would have originated earlier in the Triassic period. Also, the... Near cousins to lizards, rhynchocephalians, which includes modern-day tuataras, are found from well-diverse fossil remains in the Triassic. Yeah. So if they had already shown up, one would imagine that their sister group would have shown up. That we would expect them to have shown up earlier for everything we're seeing nowadays to make sense. Yes. But the fossils just don't go back that far. There are plenty of fossils in the Triassic of lizard-like things, (laughs) but not actual squamates true members of this lineage the lizard shape is a popular shape it sure is until now this study reports on a lizard a true lizard from the late triassic of england the specimen is a partial skeleton including a skull and jaw so top of the skull cranium and the mandibles it's about 202 million years old and it is a new genus and species, wow. which the researchers have named Cryptovarinoides microlanius. That's a mouthful. Uh, it's And it's a cool name. And the news report mentions that at least some part of that name, I think the species epithet, means small butcher. Because <laughs> it's got these sharp teeth for eating small things. <laughs> this fossil was actually discovered in a quarry in England in the 1950s by a professor, Pamela Robinson. But at the time, the fossil wasn't able to be prepared. They mentioned that it's within sediment and it was pretty delicate and they just didn't have the tools to work with it. This study comes after researchers were able to CT scan it. 
So this is one of those examples, like we've talked about before, where this is a fossil that now we can do stuff with. Yeah. Decades later. They CT scan the fossil to examine as much as they could, to reconstruct as much as they could, and what they found is a lizard. This species, they identified, they, they mentioned in the paper that they identified at least 15 features that are squamate features. Wow. That put it within lizards. And not only that, but there are features there that link it to anguimorphs. Okay. Which is the corner of the lizard family tree that includes monitor lizards and gila monsters and their cousins the cool corner all the the best ones (laughs) so not only is this seemingly a true lizard true squamate but a member of a modern group that i was not expecting yeah that this but now it's not like a monitor lizard but (laughs) it is linked closely to one of our modern lineages of lizards like i was expecting maybe it would lean a little bit you know like it it, it seems to be a bit more similar but like a more solid placement within it that's awesome yes it is cool for a handful of reasons number one it pushes the origin of true squamates in the fossil record back a good 30 million years that we jurassic to triassic Which is also a time period where we see the early appearances of things like turtles and mammals and crocs. So this makes lizards not the weird ones out compared to those other organisms. They're fitting within a, a time of diversity of reptiles. Yes. But also, since it does seem to have affinities to a specific lineage within lizards, not only does that mean that that lineage originated early in the Triassic, But that means that certain other branches of the lizard family tree must also have started earlier, like geckos and skinks, depending on the shape of the lizard family tree. Certain other branches happened before the anguimorph branch. Yes. So this actually pushes back diversification of lizards up into the Triassic period, which, like I said earlier, has been suggested. Yeah. That that was probably something that happened. We just didn't have a fossil to corroborate that before. Very cool. It's always exciting when CT scanning comes in to save the day, letting us look at delicate fossils that we would have been too afraid of to break. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And this is very interesting. Like, this is not wholly unexpected. Like, you know, as you mentioned, we, we had inklings, we had evidence, we had things that suggested that the Triassic would be where we found the earliest origins of lizards and many lizard groups. But for it to be, like, strong evidence with this fossil. Here is the lizard you were waiting to find. Yeah. Yeah. And it has implications for just the broad evolutionary patterns within the group. Like, we've talked before about how when we do phylogenetic analyses, often we will compare genetic information Mm -hmm. from modern animals with fossils. And we'll use the fossils to calibrate, to go, all right, this fossil tells us that this group was around at this time. So combine that with our DNA evidence. Well, this fossil will affect basically every phylogenetic study of lizards as a whole group yes. going forward. This is going to be a, a, a big deal calibration point. Yeah, this could shift the way we perceive the evolutionary history of lizards. Yes. <laughs> All of them. The whole group. That's very exciting. The authors also make some quick points about how this implication that the group diversified earlier in the triassic leaves us wondering was there a particular event that is linked to their diversification oh yeah because the evidence seems to suggest that they radiated before the end triassic extinction but after the permian at mass extinction and there is an event partway through the triassic called the carnian pluvial episode which was a major climate shift that has been proposed to be linked to radiations in plants and in insects and in other tetrapods. So these authors also make the note that that event could potentially also be linked to diversification in lizards Mm -hmm. now that we're seeing these fossils early on. So this has all sorts of cool implications for our understandings of the origins of squamates. Very awesome. Very fun stuff. Way to go, everybody. Well, my next bit of news doesn't really have much to do with that, but it is about beavers, and I feel like that is always an exciting thing to get to talk about. Let's do it. Beavers are fantastic. Super cool animals. I think they're very neat. These are some fossil beavers 
that seem to suggest a very similar lifestyle, or at least life history, to modern beavers. Hmm. This research is by Thomas Lechner and Madeline Bohm in the journal Acta Paleontologica Polinica, and the article is a press release in phys.org. This research is on dental remains teeth from some beavers, medium-sized beavers, they said, that date back to the early late Miocene, about 11 million years old, and come from a fossil site in Germany, southern Germany. This beaver has been given a new species name, which is Steniofiber deperitae, which would have been a little bit smaller than today's beavers. This study was looking at the teeth, which they had a bunch of, 160 teeth were included in this wow. uh, research, from two different fossil layers from this deposit, which included beavers from a large age range of individual ages, from young juvenile beavers to older beavers. Right, little babies to adults. Which allowed them to look at something interesting, which is the population dynamics of this species. Which is of note because today's beavers, as they are often famous for, are extremely social. They are very, very famous for tight-knit family groups. Unlike a lot of other rodents, like right. they have a family that multiple generations will live in the same den and raise the young. So like if the children from last year will stick around to help with the children for next year or which however many years separate them. But another thing they do is young adults, once it's time for them to leave, will have to go find their own places to make their own dens and make their own dams and make their own lakes. You got to go build your own house. But Usually the best places are already taken by older beavers right? who have already established dens. So they usually have to go into lower quality habitats. Uh, relatable. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so for the older beavers, the ideal habitats are typically major rivers that they can make large homes out of. So we often see younger beavers, you know, adult beavers forced to travel upstream to smaller waterways. Less ideal harder to survive, which means we see higher mortality rates in those beavers because they're out there on the frontier of beaver land. Yeah, yeah. And they're not having as much stability. All right, dysentery and all that. Yes. Well, the two fossil layers seem to represent two different habitats. Ooh. One being small rivulets and one being larger river. So we have beaver fossils from these two types of habitats. Uh, and a population's worth. Yes. Ooh. So they looked at the teeth to see what the population dynamics were between the two habitats. They found a clear trend of young adult beavers with particularly high mortality rates in the stream rivulet areas. Mm. With almost no cubs or older animals in that area. So these were the younger adults that were going upstream to the less ideal areas right. and were dying at seemingly high rates yeah before they had a chance to get old or make young beavers exactly mm. while the river deposit had just the opposite high mortality rate among babies which sure. that's pretty standard that's standard for baby animals just across the animals, board sadly and a linear fall in age-related mortality and the young adult beavers seem to be missing there right because these are the established communities of a parents and young kids but the young adults have already left yes so the patterns of the fossils we're seeing match this different habitat use like we see today exactly so it suggests that this species was using its habitats and moving between habitats in a very similar fashion to today's beavers which also probably means they had similar family clans mm. family groups if we're seeing such a similar pattern in how they're moving between habitats, it's probably likely that they have a similar lifestyle of family structure. They also noted that this species is interesting because it seems to overlap both in the fossil record time, but also morphologically with two other species, an older stineofiber species and a younger genus known as Calicomys, which supports previous hypotheses that th it has been a singular anagenic evolutionary lineage where one species evolving into another evolving into the next this seems to support that beavers have been a fairly singular lineage evolving from species to species up to our modern day meaning that this species is likely ancestral to our modern beavers yeah 
One of my favorite things that happens when we talk about fossil studies of ancient animals is when it teaches me stuff about modern animals. Yeah. Which intuitively makes tons of sense because they're, it's the same thing. That's what we're comparing. Mm-hmm. But it's such a fun thing to read a study and go, some ants have this antibiotic gland <laughs> and some beavers live in these sort of lifestyles. We're talking about fossils and I get to go, really? That's a cool thing about modern day animals. Right. It's it's fantastic and fascinating. And anytime you get to learn about beavers are my favorite rodent for sure. They are a very cool group of critters. They are so awesome and so weird. And I like that they've been weird for a long time. Yeah, very charismatic and unusual and just an interesting group of creatures. Yeah. We'll talk more about them in the future. <laughs> hint, hint on any requests. <laughs> Anybody who wants a beaver episode, uh, you know how to reach us. <laughs> hey, it sounds like the running trend in this episode's news is new species. Because I have another news with a new species. <laughs> this one is a new species of dinosaur that appears to be a swimmer. Oh, yeah. All right. This is research by Sung Jin Lee et al. in Communications Biology, and we will link to an article in Smithsonian Magazine by Riley Black. There has been, in the broader paleontological community and here on this podcast, lots of discussion about aquatic dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs are, by and large, animals that lived on land. The major exceptions are birds that don't live on land mm. things like penguins and auks and cormorants and diving birds there's a lot of birds that are semi-aquatic but there is very little in the way of ancient non-bird dinosaurs that seem to have spent time in water conversations the two main ones that tend to come up are spinosaurus mm-hmm. which we've talked about a thousand times that seems to have some evidence that it was at least spending time in in shallows or near water or maybe catching fish, but maybe not necessarily a swimming dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And one that came out not too long ago, a dromaeosaur, a small theropod named Halshkaraptor. Yeah. From the late Cretaceous of Mongolia. Halshkaraptor, when it came out, was celebrated as, oh, hey, this here's another candidate for maybe an aquatic dinosaur. Yeah, like it was compared to ducks and stuff yes. very heavily. <laughs> Based on its long neck, many small teeth, and the proportions of its limbs being similar to modern-day diving birds. Also a great name. And a great name named after celebrated paleontologist Halska Osmolska. But Halska Raptor did not preserve a lot of it, the rest of the body. We didn't get to learn a lot about body proportions. Gotcha. This study identifies a new small dinosaur from the same region of Mongolia in the Gobi Desert from the late Cretaceous, uh, seemingly related to Halshkaraptor, which is also diving bird shaped. Cool. It has been named Nato Venator, which is also a very cool name. Man, they are just knocking out of the park <laughs> with these. Nato Venator polydontis, new species and genus, about 71 million years old. Known from a well-preserved skeleton that shows us a good chunk of the whole body. Known from a well-preserved skeleton with a full body length that would probably have been about one foot long. Aww. So a little, little, little dinosaur. Like Halshkaraptor, it's got a long neck with many small teeth, which is something we see uh, in animals that go hunting in water for catching slippery things. But also a number of its ribs are well-preserved and in articulation. Okay. So still in relation to the other bones of the body. And the ribs appear to be in a swept back position, which is something we see in birds like penguins. That mm. helps to give a more streamlined body shape. And the shape of the ribs suggests that uh, the rib cage in total may have been more compressed yeah. for a more flattened body, which is also something we see in diving birds. These things help streamline the shape of the body. You're trying, you're making something more torpedo shaped. Exactly. This information suggests a body shape that might have been adapted for swimming. This is the kind of shape that you look for when you're looking at swimming predators. Yes. Birds today that dive, dive through the water to try to catch fish. One of the authors in the article is quoted as saying, we, we think it would have looked like a Cretaceous cormorant. <laughs> cool. 
This is notably the first time we've seen this. Mm -hmm. A lot of these evidences of possible aquatic adaptations in dinosaurs. There's actually another study that just came out about Spinosaurus. Yes. And analyzing its features. They, their conclusion was that it probably makes sense as hanging out in shallows and hunting for things in the water, but not so much as a swimmer. Like a predator that was chasing after things underwater. Yes. Which is what some other studies have said as well. This is the first time that we've seen a dinosaur that seems to have a body for swimming. Yes. Which is very cool. Yeah, for active, potentially fast, maneuverable swimming. Yes. And the fact that it seems to be a relative of Halsharaptor suggests there may have been a whole group of this whole lineage of dinosaurs adapted for swimming after prey. That's so awesome yeah the article uh, riley's article points out that future studies will probably do more biomechanical analysis yep. to see how does the body function and geochemical analysis so we might be able to find similar results for these little dinosaurs yeah of aquatic food and land food tend to have different chemical signatures that we can yes find traces of sometimes you can also get chemical signatures of environment yeah I, I don't remember if that's been done for spinosaurus off the top of my head but i know it's been done for other animals that we can try to differentiate terrestrial versus aquatic habitats yes very awesome and the, like i've seen some of the paleo art that's come out for them and they're it's very fun look like it's very intriguing to yeah. see a swimming a, a dinosaur duck a dino duck mm -hmm. and I, I immediately have so many questions of, like, how how were they doing this compared to ducks and cormorants? Because, like, okay. ducks are, you know, very on top of the water swimmers, and cormorants will do that. But also, those both fly. Yes. <laughs> those are both very yeah. flighted birds. This is not a flying animal. Yeah. It's not a bird. So, were you just puttering around the surface and then just would putter over to shore and walk away? <laughs> like <laughs> Maybe like penguins. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, oh... Oh, I yeah. want to know. And it's tiny? You could have these in your backyard pond. Just hanging out, yeah. going after the fish. Oh, you shouldn't feed them bread, though. No, uh, that, that'll it gets in the yeah. their system. It's and... popular, but it's not healthy for them. No. Uh, if you live in a place with native and native, don't throw rice. Yes, not rice. stuff at weddings. Mm -mm. That's bad. It's a bad thing to do. I've heard, like, peas and stuff <laughs> are supposed to be better. So you look up what's best. I wonder. I, I When I first saw this, I, I had a little thought in the back of my mind that said, I wonder if these authors were annoyed that the name Anatosaurus, which means duck reptile, yeah. was taken over 100 years ago. <laughs> Every now and then we'll find a new dinosaur that seems like it's way more fitting for a name that has already been used. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> well, hey, speaking of the lifestyles of various animals. That's the end of our news, which means we can move on to the main discussion of the episode. As we mentioned this episode, our topic is live birth, something that that swimming dinosaur almost certainly did not do. Yes. But we're going to talk about the animals that do. After the break, let's get into some definitions. Excellent. Our topic today is live birth, the process of bearing live young. It is a very relatable topic, as we humans are concerned. I think it's fair to say that nearly all of us have been involved in at least one live birth. Very true. The technical term for the bearing of live young is viviparity, mm -hmm. as opposed to oviparity. Oviparity means laying eggs. This is a thing that we see in lots of animals who lay eggs, and an embryo develops inside the egg, nourished by the nutrition inside the egg, and then they hatch and a baby comes out. With viviparity in viviparous animals, there is no egg intermediate, the embryo develops inside the body, and then an offspring emerges directly from the body. Yes. Now, there are a lot of places where the subject of live birth is liable to be misinterpreted, and one of them is that live birth and egg laying are two completely different things. Yes. Whereas, as is often the case, they are two ends of a spectrum. And we're going to talk uh, in a little bit about the variety of ways 
to give live birth and the ways that the lines between oviparity and viviparity are kind of blurry. But first, another thing that I think might not be immediately apparent is just how widespread live bearing is. I think it's very easy for us to get the idea in our head that live bearing is the thing that mammals do. And that's what makes us special. That's what makes us special and everybody else lays eggs. Yep. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if you just started, went down the street asking people, a lot of people might think that that's the case. I know that that's not true, and you know that that's not true, but I also, before taking the notes for this episode, did not know how untrue that was. <laughs> so let's start, before we do anything else, with talking about who gives live birth. How widespread is it for animals to bear live young? Let's start with mammals. Nearly all living mammals give live birth. All marsupials and all eutherians, or placental mammals, they are named, that name is related, mm -hmm. all bear live young. That is all but two kinds of, of mammals in the world today. Platypuses and echidnas are monotremes. They lay eggs. Yep. They are the egg-laying mammals, but all the rest are live bearers. So it, it is almost universally a mammal feature. Yes, but not quite. Reptiles, including birds, we think of as egg layers, mm -hmm. and typically they are. There are no live-bearing birds or crocs or turtles, but about 20% of lizards and snakes bear live young. That is a bigger percentage than I was expecting. It's quite a bit. And this includes things like uh, a lot of vipers mm -hmm. give birth to live young, boas give birth to live young. There's tons of lizards that do it. There are, and considering that there are several thousand species of lizards and snakes. That's a lot of species that yeah. bear live young. 20% makes up a bunch of animals. Yes. Uh, I know I've seen videos of chameleons uh, giving live birth and just the baby falling onto the leaves below. <laughs> <laughs> there are a handful, relative, a very small number, but a handful of examples in amphibians. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There are live-bearing salamanders and Sicilians, and I think in some frogs as well. Yes. Fish have a habit of giving live birth. Bony fish, it's relatively rare. There are some, like coelacanths will do it, half beaks will do it. But cartilaginous fish, the group that includes sharks, rays, skates, more than half of all modern cartilaginous fish bear live young. Yeah, that is supremely common among this group. There are egg layers. You know, you'll, mermaid's course. purse is the famous yeah, the shark egg, egg. Egg cases. Yes. But like great white sharks and mm -hmm. a lot of their relatives give birth to live young, and so on. And there are also tons of invertebrates that give live birth. Now, in my researching, I mentioned earlier in the episode that we are very vertebrate biased, <laughs> but so is most of biology. It seems that there has not been nearly as much research into live birth habits in invertebrates. Mm -hmm. But some quick Google searching and Google Scholar searching led me to mentions of live birth in the following groups of invertebrates, segmented worms, velvet worms, nematodes, salps, isopods, sea stars, crinoids, urchins, snails, bivalves, sea cucumbers, tunicates, scorpions, sponges, bryozoans, and more. <laughs> and notably, I found references that there are thousands of examples of live bearing species in flatworms okay. and insects. Yep. And the insects include certain flies, beetles, earwigs, true bugs, cockroaches, invertebrates are given live birth all left and right. Which, from like an invertebrate point of view, like yeah, insects, they're doing everything. Yeah, of course insects are doing it. Yeah, so that's not hugely surprising. But yeah, that's not what we typically think of. No, live birth is surprisingly widespread surprisingly even to me who already knew it was widespread yes did not know that many creatures do this mm -hmm. so this is an extremely common habit among animals but not only is live birth diverse taxonomically in terms of who does it but also in how it is done there are a lot of ways to give live birth there's tons of variation Let's talk about a little bit of it. <laughs> one, one of the most important ways that different animal live birth practices differ is in the way that the embryo is provided with nutrition. Mm -hmm. Lysithotrophy, 
is the scientific term for when an embryo is nourished by nutrients from a yolk. This is what we think of an X. Yes. Uh, a bird lays an egg. There is a yolk in there, and the yolk is a nutrition packet that will sustain the embryo until it's ready to hatch into a bouncing baby, whatever the animal is. A lot of live bearing animals also have a yolk. Yep. They retain a yolk inside the bot. So they're carrying the embryo inside instead of laying an egg, but there's still a yolk. That's still where the nutrition is coming from. There are a number of animals that basically just have an egg, but don't lay it. Yeah, exactly. They retain the egg inside, yolk and all, and hatching essentially takes place within the body and then the young comes out. Yes. And this doesn't mean like, you know, an egg that they're going to have to crack out of, but all the parts and internal life support of the egg is just maintained inside the body instead of putting it in a nest. Yes. Uh, I I remember back in school, that one was sometimes called ovoviviparity. Yes. Ovoviviparity is a term that these days is outdated. Yes. It's not used very often. Uh, par- par- partially just because it's confusing. Yeah, absolutely. It's another line to draw on this spectrum. But um, it was the first thing I was introduced to, the ac- the idea that it is not a duality. Yes. There are things in between full live birth and pure egg. Yeah. There are uh, lizards that do that. There are fish that do that. This, what used to be called ovoviviparity. There are also animals that will do basically that but there's not an egg Mm -hmm. there's a yolk but not all the other parts of the egg are still there there's a lot of intermediates yes the other main nutritional habit is metrotrophy which means the nutrition is coming from somewhere else not a yolk typically from the parent body itself the most familiar version of this and uh, by some accounts the most advanced and complex version of this is called placentotrophy. Yes. A placenta. This is what mammals, uh, well, placental mammals have. This is what (laughs) us mammals have, the way humans do it, where there is a placenta, which is a special structure in the womb that facilitates exchange of materials. So the placenta actually connects the embryo directly to the parent body. It provides nutrients to nourish the embryo and also removes waste. Mm Mm-hmm. So a placenta is a very complex interaction between parent body and embryo that's developing. Famously, mammals do this. We are not the only ones Mm -hmm. to have a placenta or at least a very placenta-like structure. This has been seen in some lizards, some sharks, worms, insects, scorpions. We are not the only placenta-bearing creatures in the world. Which is very intriguing because so this is what the umbilical cord is connecting between. Yes, in the, us. In, yes, in that's us. That's what that's doing. Is connecting the baby to the placenta, and that I don't, that and I know that there are other animals that also have umbilical cord like structures that yes. have a a pipe between. Oh, yeah. Even some with yolks. Yes, an umbilical cord structure can have multiple ways that it fits in. Exactly. So it. It's intriguing since that is such an identifying thing for our human experience that it is not unique to just us and our cousins. Nope. That is very, very cool. (laughs) There are other alternatives to having a placenta for live-bearing animals. There are habits known as histotrophy or histophagy, where the embryo will absorb or sometimes feed on nutrients from the tissues of the parent body more directly. Some of you may be familiar with oophagy or embryophagy, (laughs) which is where there are multiple developing embryos and they will get their nourishment, at least in part, from the other developing embryos. Yeah. Uh, There are some cases where they'll absorb nutrients from the other eggs, Mm -hmm. like the other yolks. So there'll be multiple eggs or embryos with their own yolks, and one embryo will end up being fed by all of the yolks. And then, of course, there are examples where one embryo will eat the other embryos. Yep. (laughs) Like in some sharks. Yes. The sand tiger sharks, the famous one you'll come across with that, where they only give birth to two youngs because they have a dual lobed womb Mm -hmm. to keep those two separate from each other while they eat the other embryos that are in those two sections. Yes. (laughs) So they can develop (laughs) to being able to be born. So there are lots of strategies for getting the embryos the nutrients they need to develop 
until they're ready to face the world. There are also other habits that will come up sort of in relation to this that aren't necessarily live birth. I've seen papers that discuss brooding, which in at least one paper I read defined that as incubating embryos elsewhere. Yeah. Like not in a womb or, or a traditional structure, which is, by the way, another way that live birth can vary is where the embryos are actually developing. Mm -hmm. It can be in the uterus, in the oviducts, in the ovaries. It can be in a number of different parts of the reproductive system. We talked about seahorses where the males have a very placenta-like chamber mm -hmm. that is specific to them. <laughs> yes. In episode 136, brooding I've seen referred to kind of similar to that, where you have species that will incubate the embryos somewhere different. Yeah. For example, in pockets on the skin, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. some frogs will do. Or in the stomach, yep. which some frogs will do. Because <laughs> <laughs> frogs. Because frogs. Ooh. I've also seen the term pseudoviviparity. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Which is something that you see, uh, for example, in some invertebrates, where eggs are laid, fertilized outside the body, and then taken in to a part of the body to be incubated. I didn't know they took it back up. That's They'll take it back in. And, and I've seen it examples as into the stomach or sometimes into the lungs, huh. like brachial chambers. Because typically, live-bearing animals have internal fertilization. Yes. Right. A lot of animals, females lay eggs, and then males fertilize the eggs out in the open. A lot of fish do this, for example. Having internal fertilization where they copulate allows male material to just enter the body of the female, fertilize the eggs, and development can happen from there. That's generally considered a prerequisite for live bearing. Yeah, cool, because then the embryo is inside the body the whole time. Yes, you don't have to lay an egg at all. But there are some species that will lay eggs, have them fertilized, and then take them back and incubate them. That's some sci-fi stuff right there, and I love it. Which is kind of live bearing young. Yeah. So... Hence, pseudo-viviparity. Like, at the finish line, it's going to look the same. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Also, I want to make quick mention of the term vivipary, which is not hardly at all related to this. <laughs> but if you go Googling, you might accidentally come across it. Viviparity means live bearing of young. Vivipary is something in plants where seeds begin to develop before they detach from the parent plant. Okay. So it's kind of a little bit like viviparity. Yeah, it is. But it, mostly it's just a very similar word. That you're dropping almost saplings instead of s seeds. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I get it. I get it. Uh, but we're not going to talk about plants at all for the rest of the episode. So sorry. Next episode's a plants episode. <laughs> we'll have Alien. So viviparity can vary based on how the embryos are being nourished, where they're developing inside the body. Another way that it can be variable is the duration of gestation. Gestation is the period while the embryo is developing inside the body, both in terms of just how long it takes before it's born and how much development happens. Yeah, how done the baby is. How <laughs> done is the baby. So to use a very personal example, in humans, gestational period is about nine months. Mm -hmm. And what's born at the end of it is a baby that is way underdeveloped oh yeah that is an undercooked human <laughs> there is way more development left to be done our skulls and even one piece yet <laughs> versus when you see like a horse or animals that live out on the savannah where they're born and they stand up and then they go walking alongside the parents yep there are extremes the shortest gestational period that i saw referenced while i was reading was certain marsupials have a gestational period that can be under two weeks. It's like a 10 or 12 days of gestation. That, mean, that means if they're a little bit behind on taking the pregnancy test, the baby could become <laughs> <laughs> Now, one of the reasons marsupials can do, the reason they do that is because when a marsupial is born, it, is, it makes a human baby look ready to face the world. Yes. Marsupials are born very, very under, very early in development. And then they crawl into the pouch and then continue developing in there. Yeah, that acts basically as a secondary womb of sorts. Yes. On the other hand, some gestational periods can be very long. Will, if I were to ask you 
what animal has the longest gestational period? What would you say? Because I bet you'd say the answer that I would have said. Whale comes to mind very quickly. Whales are certainly up there. Yep, whale comes to mind. I know elephants have very long yeah. ones. Elephants are typically cited as the longest gestation. Nice. Uh, elephant gestation period is almost two years. Yep, that's what I remembered hearing. 21, 22 months. And that would have been my answer. But apparently, elephants are outdone. It's again, This is going to be something super small, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, it is. I knew it. It's a salamander. I knew it. <laughs> That's always how it goes. Is it's, Here's the logical ones. The th- largest animal on the planet and yep. the largest <laughs> land animal on the planet beat out by itty bitty little salamander. By this, I saw multiple references cite this as the record holder. Salamandra atra, the alpine salamander, which is found in mountainous regions in Europe, can have gestational periods of up to four or five years. Wow. Yeah. And I saw one report. I saw this mentioned once, and I did not find more details about this. But one reference reportedly said that the salamanders in the womb not only fully develop, right? They they fully develop and come out ready to face the world. That they undergo metamorphosis <laughs> in the womb. <laughs> that's like if that's that's the equivalent of going through puberty in yeah. the womb. <laughs> now I did not get more details about that. If there's anyone out there who's an expert in alpine salamanders, there may be more to it than that. But these salamanders are holding on to these embryos for a very, very long time. I also saw some references of certain fish that have multi-year gestations. Yeah. Uh, There was one ray, I think, Mm -hmm. that had like a three or four year gestation period. Interesting. And while we're on the note of different developmental stages, we also see a lot of variation in that in insects. Mm -hmm. So it is not uncommon for insects to do what we were describing before, hold on to the egg until it hatches and then what you are depositing is larvae instead of eggs. Tsetse flies are an example where the egg phase ends and they hold on to the larva where it continues developing inside the womb and then the larva is birthed when it's ready to pupate. Yeah. So the first thing the larva does is burrow in somewhere and form a pupa. Yeah, so it doesn't give birth to a fly, but the first thing that baby does is get ready to become a fly. Yes. It'll be like if a butterfly gave birth to a caterpillar which immediately formed a cocoon. Exactly. And then there are, of course, the famous example of aphids, which under certain circumstances will give birth to live young who themselves already have an embryo developing inside of them. Yeah, this is the the gray goo scenario of (laughs) (laughs) uh, uh, micro machines being able to replicate themselves. Yes. These are just insectoid (laughs) 3D printers. And so there is quite a bit of variation in how things are happening and how much stuff is happening and when in the developmental process the developing young emerge from the parent. Viviparity is extremely variable and diverse among animals today. Which I think brings to, to at least my mind, kind of an important revelation about live birth. I think it is very easy at least in the way I've seen it portrayed in textbooks and in discussion, that live birth is this super special, refined, complex, I'm not saying it's not complex, but complicated machination that live birth is this just enigma. But really, you just have to cook and feed the baby until it's ready to come out. <laughs> Pretty like, much. Those there's are a, the steps. There's a lot of ways to do it. And so I like that the the diversity of it brings to attention that the process what you're trying to achieve is rather simple it's not an easy task per se Mm -hmm. but it is a straightforward you need the baby to grow which means it needs to feed and it needs to be kept safe until it's ready to come out so you can change all three of those steps kind of however you want as long as you're doing it adequately and we see that in all of these diverse ways And this brings us to the subject of the evolution of live birth, which before we get into more of those details, I want to bring up another way that live birth can easily be misrepresented. And it is the same way that we've discussed with cold bloodedness versus warm bloodedness, Mm -hmm. which is also one of those that's not actually a dichotomy. Nope. 
there, there's a lot of blurriness around those terms. There's a lot of ways to warm your body. But also, it is very common for us warm-blooded mammals to think of warm-bloodedness as the obvious upgrade. Yes. Everything's cold-blooded, and then warm-blooded is the better version. That if you were in a video game skill tree, this would be further up. <laughs> right. And live birth, I've seen discussed in a very similar way. That egg-laying is the default, and if you're lucky, you can upgrade mm -hmm. to live birth evolutionarily. But of course, that's not the case. No. Live birth and egg laying are not only two completely different things, not only not two completely different things, but also they are alternatives. There are both costs and benefits to live bearing, which is important to understand when we talk about when and how and why this habit evolves. So let's talk about some of those very briefly. There are obviously benefits to live birth. There are things that are really convenient and nice about viviparity. One is that it is a great way to keep the embryos safe from predators and parasites and adverse conditions. You don't have to worry about them getting a, a nest getting washed away in a rainstorm like you do with eggs. Yeah, they're not stationary, stuck in one spot. Right. If conditions get really bad in that habitat, the parent can just walk away. <laughs> the, 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 the embryos are here inside the body. They are carry-on. They are carry on. So anywhere the parent goes, right, if it's if it's too hot or too cold or there's too many lions or whatever, the parent can just move and carry the embryos along. Also, in live birth, embryos are physiologically maintained by the parent's body. So they are pretty much always going to be kept the right temperature. They're going to have the right conditions surrounding them because they're just body conditions. Yes. You don't. There's no concern about the nest getting too cold or too hot, which we see with a lot of egg-laying creatures, where if it gets too cold, a whole nest might just be done for. Yeah, be lost. Or animals that care for their nest have to put in a ton of effort maintaining that, the condition of the nest. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's really beneficial about live birth is that for viviparous animals, there is, in some respects, less of an investment up front. Mm -hmm. If an animal is laying an egg, it has to produce the egg and the yolk mm -hmm. all up front. It's a much larger down payment. Yes. Whereas a live bearing animal is providing the embryos with nutrients throughout. So they can just continue to produce nutrients. There isn't this one big packet at the start. It also means, uh, and this is a little bit morbid, that if something goes wrong, there wasn't as much invested energetically in the first place. Yeah, if that egg cracks, all the effort that went into that egg is completely lost. That animal already made yolk. That was a lot of energy, a lot of materials lot of that went, went into creating that egg and the yolk. Live bearing, if something goes wrong, the parent has conserved some of that energetic and nutritional cost. Yeah, it's... It, if something happens halfway through development, you don't lose the full amount of resources like you do with an egg. You lose half the resources. There are even animals that can resorb embryos or some of the extra tissues that are produced during reproduction to kind of get some of that energy back. Because at the end of the day, evolution is a horrible numbers oh, game. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Th thriftiness can get really dark <laughs> yep. when it comes to evolution. <laughs> Moving on to challenges. So live bearing has all sorts of nice benefits, reasons why we can understand live birth might be supported through natural selection. It's beneficial. It helps organisms to more efficiently have offspring. But there are downsides. There are reasons why a lineage might not do that. The first major challenge of live bearing is that an animal that gives live birth also has to be pregnant. Yep. Now, I have not myself been pregnant, but I've talked to people who have been pregnant, and it can be really inconvenient to be pregnant. A bit of an ordeal. <laughs> a pregnancy in an animal can be very taxing. Yes. It can take a lot of energy. It can interfere with an animal's ability to move around, mm -hmm. especially in animal species where they gain a lot of weight while developing the embryos inside. So it can make it harder to get food or harder to move around. 
Another challenge is that in some cases, because all the embryos has to have to fit within the body of the parent, it can limit how many embryos can develop at one time. Whereas with egg laying, an animal can just lay a bunch of eggs mm -hmm. and then the eggs are developing. That that's now that process is done. Yes. It also, and with egg laying, something that some animals can do is lay a batch of eggs and while those are developing, start making more eggs. Yeah, exactly. Which is much harder to, not impossible, but it's not as easy to accomplish with live bearing young. Yeah, you can lay the egg when it's ready <laughs> and yeah, start on the next batch, which is pretty cool. Yes. Another potential downside of viviparity is... And this is sort of the flip side where I mentioned earlier that a live bearing parent can move around and make sure that it's staying in good conditions and avoiding predators and parasites and stuff. But if something does happen to the parent, that's it yep. for the whole batch of embryos. Absolutely. So there is a trade-off. There is a very clear trade-off between egg laying and live bearing. It's also important to keep in mind that a lot of the benefits that we see with viviparity, a lot of egg-laying animals do that anyway. Mm -hmm. Birds are a great example. Birds invest tons of effort and time and energy in caring for their nests and caring for their young, and they end up getting a bunch of the benefits that viviparous animals get anyway. Yes. Because they are maintaining the temperature of the nest and they are keeping away predators and parasites and things like that. So it, it also isn't two completely different strategies. There's a lot of overlap and in between. Yes. Well, I like that one of the features, the fact that the animal can carry the embryo with them is both a pro and a con mm -hmm. that the animal has to carry the embryo. It doesn't have another option. So all of those struggles of carrying the em embryo are constant. Right. Whilst if you lay an egg, the parents can leave the nest yes. and go get food, go get resources, take turns. Oh, sure. So you have more flexibility with that. And going back to like the dark, you know, practicality of evolution, if worse comes to worse, the parents can abandon the nest if the predator attacks or something. Yeah. And go on to lay more eggs. Yeah. So it is very much, they are alternative strategies with plenty of pros and cons, which is probably one of the reasons why we see so much diversity and variation in reproductive habits. Mm -hmm. Now, on the note of evolution of viviparity, there has been a lot of discussion in the literature of how viviparity comes to be. Generally speaking, viviparity evolves from oviparity. The ancestors of live-bearing animals tend to have been egg-laying animals, so at some point there was a transition from laying eggs to live birth. One of the sort of long-standing popular hypotheses about how this happens is a very intuitive one. We talked about the fact that there are lots of animals that just retain their eggs. Mm -hmm. And this is something we see in egg-laying animals, where sometimes they'll hold on to an egg longer before laying the egg, and then there's that other strategy where they hold on to the egg the whole time and then give live birth. Mm -hmm. It's easy to imagine a scenario where a lineage just holds on to the egg longer and longer until it's giving live birth. Then the egg and the egg materials are lost, giving way to something to eggless reproduction completely. This makes total sense. We see intermediate stages active in modern animals today. And we also see that in a lot of species, the tissues that nourish the young during the development before giving live birth, those tissues are often the same tissues that we see in eggs. Yes. They've just been repurposed. Structures like the Coriolantoas, which in egg-laying lizards is in the egg to nourish the young, but in live-bearing lizards can sometimes be acting more like a placenta to facilitate nutrient exchange between the parent and the embryos. Yeah, this is why we see a lot of parallels between the internal anatomy of an egg and a womb. So it's very easy to imagine that egg retention until it's live birth, but there is some evidence that that's not the only way that this can happen. For example, there have been some studies that seem to indicate 
that in mammals, the yolk was lost before live birth came about. Okay. That they developed specialized tissues for nourishing the young before getting rid of the egg. Notably, monotremes do that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Monotremes have matrotrophic oviparity. They went a different route. So there's probably multiple different ways to develop live bearing from egg laying. Yeah. Which, of course, uh, is not surprising given how many times live birth has evolved. Which brings us to an incredible question. How many times has live birth evolved? You are not ready for the answer to this question. No, all of them. All I of the Every time. All of the times. <laughs> live birth has evolved so many times. I read one study that said, I will quote, The multiple origins of viviparity and matrotrophy surely rank among the grandest examples of evolutionary convergence. Yeah, that makes sense. Let's dive in. Mammals probably evolved live birth once. Yeah. That the ancestors of marsupials and placentals at somewhere in that lineage 160 million years ago or more, because that's when that split happened, developed live birth and all the eutherians and metatherians, the marsupials and placentals, inherited that. Monotremes split off before that happened, so they retained egg laying. For mammals, it seems like that's probably what happened. One time, and then they just stuck that way. Yes, which makes sense, especially since marsupials are all doing it in a very similar way, and placentals are all doing it in a very similar way. Like, yes, it makes sense that our origin is not for each group of mammals. In amphibians, live bearing seems to have evolved probably several times. The numbers I saw referenced were five to eight. Okay. This is being investigated so we don't have a solid number in fish it has happened a bunch i saw numerous studies reference that it seems to have evolved more than a dozen times in Mm. bony fish and 10 perhaps 20 times in cartilaginous fish yeah that checks out that the transition from egg laying to live bearing has happened dozens of times across fish I saw one study that said in invertebrates, it has evolved at least 26 times. (laughs) But that seemed, given the list that I said before, that seems like a really small number. Yes, it does. So I will remind us that invertebrate, this has been understudied in invertebrates. It wouldn't surprise me at all if it's way more than that. And then there's squamates. Yeah, that's what I was waiting for. Lizards and snakes are the group that is referred to as squamates. Numerous studies have concluded that viviparity, live bearing of young, has evolved in squamates over 100 times. There are at least 35 modern-day genera within lizards and snakes where the genus has egg-laying and live-bearing species. Yes, that's that's why I was waiting for that, because I knew that there were groups of lizards where it's like, here's this group of lizards, also this species gives live birth, moving on. Yes. Like... It's obviously not a group feature. That species evolved it. There are different groups of species that seem to have independently evolved live birth. That it's happened multiple times within a genus. Wow. Some of these have happened very recently. One study estimated at least one modern species evolved viviparity in the Pleistocene. (laughs) So last million years or so. There are tons of examples of genera with multiple different strategies among species. There are at least three species of lizards, species of lizards that have egg laying populations and live bearing populations. Yeah. That this transition has happened within a species Mm -hmm. that we have around today. And then there was a study in 2019, which we discussed on the podcast. This was episode 86 where researchers observed a three toed skink in Australia which is one of those species where some populations give live birth and some don't. In this study, researchers reported an individual lizard had a litter of four, and it laid three of them as eggs, one of which went on to hatch, and then a few weeks later gave birth to the last one. (laughs) So not only in lizards and snakes is live birth variable within a genus and within a species, 
Here's an example of live birth being variable within a litter. Yeah, within an individual. Not even within an individual. <laughs> with the same litter of babies. Yeah. <laughs> like, the this this lizard's sibling mm-hmm. hatched from an egg and it was born. It seems to just be extraordinarily variable in lizards and snakes. There has even been debate over how many times we think live birth has evolved into egg laying. Yeah, gone back. That this has <laughs> that this has, seems like there's a good chance it's actually gone back and forth over the evolutionary history of squamates. Which, from the benefits and the pros and cons list we talked about, is kind of the ideal. Like, mm-hmm. if as a lineage over the history of your your family tree, your ancestors and descendants can use the tactic that is most beneficial for whatever situation is currently at hand, yeah. If eggs work best in this environment, eggs. If live birth works best, live birth. (laughs) And it seems like that has kind of happened across the history of squamates, which means that squamates are kind of the ultimate example of that thesis point that I made very early on in our discussion. Viviparity and oviparity are nowhere near as different as we often think of them. There is a very clear spectrum from one to the other, and lizards and snakes seem to just kind of go back and forth across that spectrum as needed. Once again, the three steps that have to be met is keeping the embryo alive, feeding it, and holding on to it until it's ready to come out. Yep. Eggs do that, so does live birth. (laughs) Not only is there lots of convergent evolution in origins of live bearing, but also in more advanced versions of nutritional provisioning. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So matrotrophy seems to have evolved many times. Placentas have evolved many, many times, or at least placentation. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. something that is like a placenta. I saw one study that suggested that matrotrophic nutritional provisioning seems to have evolved at least 30 times across different groups of animals. There are lizards, uh, specifically certain skinks, I think, that have basically placentae. Yeah. And the convergence between their placenta and mammal placenta goes down to, like, the cellular level of what the activities of the cells involved. This is one of the, as the, as the quote said, grandest examples of convergent evolution. This is just a thing that life does sometimes. Yeah. And once again, this just drives home that fact that live birth is not the end result of evolution for for giving birth to young, but also that we humans are not just somehow above the rest of the animal kingdom. Yeah, we aren't just doing the best version. Exactly. We might be doing the best version for us, mm -hmm. certainly. And we may be doing a very complex version, but there are other animals that are basically doing the exact same steps we're doing yeah so it's important to remember that most of the life features are on these spectrums and we are also yes on that spectrum (laughs) now this discussion brings up tons of questions for example under what conditions do we think live birth might evolve what patterns do we see in the evolution and we will talk about that but we have to take a little bit of a detour because before we want to go more into patterns of evolution of live birth, we got to talk about fossils. Woo! Because that's one of our biggest sources of evidence for the evolutionary history of this behavior. So after the break, let us explore evidence of live birth in the fossil record, which is going to be just as cool as this first part of the discussion. Stay tuned. So far, our discussion of live birth and our understanding of the variety and evolution of live birth has mainly come from what we know about modern day animals and uh, genetic studies, trying to sort the evolutionary origins of various things. But of course, when we're looking at the evolution of things, especially when we talk about them on this, a paleontology podcast, we also want to look at the fossil record. It is what the people expect. It's what they want. (laughs) Which raises the important question of how do we recognize live birth in the fossil record? Because it sounds like it'd be super easy. You find an animal 
and inside the animal are the remains of a smaller version of that animal. But that is also what you see in cases of things like food, Mm -hmm. gut contents. And given the conversation that we've had before, what you might expect to see of just an animal developing eggs inside of its body. Finding evidence for egg laying in the fossil record is real easy because eggs will fossilize sometimes. That's nice. You find a nest of eggs with some baby dinosaurs in them. Great. Live birth can be a little trickier. And yet there are tons of examples of live bearing animals in the fossil record to illustrate what that looks like and how we identify them. I'm going to focus in on a case study. This is a study that came out last month in November. Convenient. If if we weren't doing live birth as this episode topic, it would have been one of my newses (laughs) for this episode. This study reports a fossil of a live birth giving snake. Nice. Yeah, this is research by Mariana Chulliver et al. in uh, the journal called The Science of Nature, which, well done. (laughs) The snake itself is a boa-like snake named Mesolophus from the Messel Pit of Germany, a very famous Eocene fossil site. It's about 47 million years old. The snake itself, full grown, full length, would be about half a meter long. Okay. Not very long, with smaller snake bones inside the body cavity. These authors used a couple of lines of evidence to conclude that these are embryo remains. First of all, their location is quite far back in the body of the snake, well past the stomach, and they point out that any food that makes it this far back in the digestive system would be digested. It would be poop now. You would basically not find anything, and even if you did, there'd be signs of predation or digestion. That is not the case here. These are not gut contents. Also, they fit being an embryo because the bones themselves are not fully formed. They're not fully developed. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they are more developed than we'd expect to see from early stage embryos. Comparing with modern snakes, these embryos are near to being fully formed. Mm -hmm. If this were an egg-laying snake, embryos at this stage, we'd expect it would already have laid the eggs. Yeah. That they would have continued developing in the egg up until this stage. Yeah. That this part of the development would happen in the egg outside the parent. Yes. This snake has a bunch in common with modern-day live-bearing snakes. Therefore, they conclude this is an example of a snake that is gravid. So gravid is a term that's sometimes used for other animals that means pregnant. Mm -hmm. Uh, But sometimes researchers will reserve pregnant for people. Yes. And then gravid is used for other animals, or sometimes it's for fish and reptiles. Yeah, I hear it used for eggs very often. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it is multi-use. Right. This this snake is with offspring (laughs) in the body. This makes it the first time a fossil snake has been identified as being live-bearing. First viviparous fossil snake. Awesome. Very cool. Way to go, Mariana Chulliver et al. Super cool find. This same sort of evidence, the same sort of fossil, has been found for tons of different animals. Like this one, a lot of these come from the Cenozoic, the last 60 million years or so. There are examples in fish in mammals, in lizards. Uh, There was this one from not too long ago, I remember, of a pregnant horse. Oh, yeah. That had uh, embryo remains within the body. There's a bunch of very cool examples of these, and they can tell us things about the reproductive habits of those creatures. For the purposes of this discussion, I'm not going to focus in on the fossils that are familiar circumstances. I want to talk about Ancient groups and record breakers. Yeah, because like a horse with an embryo inside is very cool. Absolutely. But we expect that a horse, even very ancient horses, should be giving live birth since all mammals (laughs) in that lineage give live birth. But the fossil record can also give us new information about what ancient groups were live bearing. Now, because we're on the note of uh, lizards and snakes... The oldest known live-bearing lizard, at least that I saw reference to, came from a 2011 study, a lizard called Yabanosaurus from the early Cretaceous of China, which was gravid with over 15 young. Wow. 
very much like the snake, late stage embryos. This is a cool one because this is an early branching lineage of lizards, which suggests that not only is viviparity a very common thing in lizards, they've been doing it for a long, long, long time. (laughs) That evidently it's always been easy for them to develop into this. Yep. But moving on to extinct groups, but staying within lizards, (laughs) mosasaurs. Yep, I was waiting for it. We talked about this in episode 51. There's evidence for live birth in mosasaurs. Mosasaurs, for those uninitiated, are the ancient group of large aquatic, of large fully aquatic lizards. Mm -hmm. They are lizards that were convergent with whales. And I like saying that sentence because it's one of the best sentences (laughs) that there is. (laughs) There is a well-known study from 2001 that described a specimen of Carsosaurus, which is an early Mosasaur, Roy Mosasaur cousin that has been interpreted as possibly being semi-aquatic with embryos inside the body. Early evidence of viviparity in Mosasaurs. There was also another study, for example, of Clydastes, a different type of Mosasaur, not of a gravid individual, but of very, very young newborn remains in an ancient open ocean setting, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which suggests that they were giving birth in the open ocean. A lot of aquatic animals today, aquatic amniotes, right, air-breathing animals today, either give live birth, like whales, or, like sea turtles, have to go up on land to lay eggs because amniotic eggs can't survive underwater. Yeah, once you add that shell... That really messes with the underwater capabilities of an egg. So, mosasaurs. Multiple examples of evidence of mosasaurs giving live birth. There are others. There are multiple examples of plesiosaurs and their cousins giving live birth. This is the other, another one of the ancient marine reptile groups, episode 72. The famous ones are the ones with the long necks and the paddle flippers front and back. An example comes from 2011, a plesiosaur named Polycotylus from the late Cretaceous that had one fetus, late stage embryo, no signs of predation, inside the body, which suggests that they were having a single large offspring Mm -hmm. instead of multiple, like a whole litter of offspring. Which kind of makes sense since a lot of these were big animals oftentimes. And we see marine mammals do that today, where they have one big baby at a time. There are also less commonly known aquatic animals. In 2010, there was a report of Hyphalosaurus, which is a semi-aquatic reptile in a group called Charistodiers, which we've talked about a couple times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Early Cretaceous, this group is freshwater. So this is a live-bearing freshwater reptile. Uh, This specimen had 18 embryos in it. Wow! And their size and posture suggests they were near to birth. That's almost ready to come out. That is a litter. That's a big litter. <laughs> oh. And then probably the most famous group of fossil animals that have been found pregnant are ichthyosaurs. Mm-hmm. We talked about this in episode 116. These are the fish-shaped aquatic reptiles of the Mesozoic era. Not only have several different specimens of ichthyosaurs been found with embryos inside, several different genera mm-hmm. of ichthyosaurs, tons of species of ichthyosaurs, have been found with embryos in the body. Multiple specimens have been found with embryos part way out of the body. Yeah. Like sticking half in and half out. Which is insane. Which in some cases is often suggested as possibly an an individual that died during birth, but some of them could also be post-mortem as the body was decomposing the embryo got pushed out by decomposition gases or something. Yeah, that an individual with an embryo, with, with a ready to, you know, near ready to be born embryo died and then the embryo started to come out after right. death. But there are other more compelling cases. A 2014 study described a Chauhusaurus, which is an ichthyosaur-ish. So this is one of those early members of the lineage that is either ichthyosaur or close to it. <laughs> All the way back in the early Triassic, 248 million years ago, right at the start of the ichthyosaur lineage, that has two embryos, one completely inside the body, another one partially in and partially out, and then a newborn next to the adult body. Yep. Which does seem to suggest that this ichthyosaur 
died during the process of giving birth. Yes. Uh, which, as is often the case, very sad, awesome fossil. Yep, great paleontology. <laughs> These examples are all amniotes. They're all reptiles. Mm-hmm. Among amniotes, the oldest known evidence in the fossil record of live birth comes from a specimen that was described in 2012, which is a mesosaur, which is an earlier group of, again, aquatic reptiles. More on that in a little bit. This comes from Uruguay and Brazil, the early Permian. Wow. This is a specimen with advanced stage embryos inside, no recognizable indications of eggshell, seemingly a viviparous reptile, almost 300 million years old. Yeah. The oldest fossil evidence of live bearing in an amniote, in a, in a terrestrial animal. Wow. This goes back quite a ways. Now, if you're paying attention, when I say that's the oldest example in an amniote, you might be wondering, are there older examples in non-amniotes? And yes, there are tons of examples of live bearing in fish. I found examples of fossil coelacanths. Uh, apparently, there are both fossil coelacanths with eggs and live bearing coelacanths in the fossil record. Interesting. Very cool. But two that I'll mention specifically because they were noted as record breakers. A 2011 study described a specimen of Harpagofugitor, a small chondrichthian. So these are cartilaginous fish, the group that includes sharks and rays. Two specimens from Montana, both with multiple fetuses within them. Carboniferous, 318 million years ago. The report specified that the, there's, there is soft tissue there but it shows no evidence of yolk sacs. Okay. So possibly these were nourishing the embryos some other way. These were matrotrophic. Mm -hmm. If so, this could be the earliest evidence of matrotrophy in the fossil record. These specimens also showed that the embryos within the body came in multiple sizes and degrees of development, suggesting that they may have been bearing multiple litters at the same time. Yeah, yeah. A process called superfetation. <laughs> cool. Which would also be the oldest example of that. So not only has viviparity existed for a while, it has been diverse and variable for a very long time. And then there's the record holder, at least as far as the references I read, these are the current record holders. They come from Australia, the Gogo Formation, Late Devonian, 380 million years old, the oldest fossil examples of live-bearing animals are placoderms. Yeah, that These makes... are the armored fish that we talked about back in episode 29. That makes sense. Multiple specimens of different genera, different species in different genera, with embryos inside, some of which were originally identified as food, gut contents, <laughs> and then later re-identified. These include incisoscutum, Ostrotacotus, and relatively famous species, named in 2008, Materpiscus, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, whose name, I believe, comes from mother fish. Yep, yep. Because it had an embryo inside. Materpiscus is actually Materpiscus attenboroughi. Yes, it is. This one was named after Sir David Attenborough. The Materpiscus specimen includes one embryo and soft tissue remains. The soft tissue remains have been interpreted to include an umbilical cord, and possibly a yolk sac. So we have soft tissue evidence of what was going on inside these oldest examples of live-bearing fish in the fossil record. Super cool. It's, it's awesome. It's fantastic that we can get fossils. Like, yeah. You know, you said finding an embryo inside is one thing, but the rest of the stuff is soft tissue. So there's also that inkling of but, but what if the placenta just never fossilizes mm -hmm. so it is very cool that we've gotten so many good fossils and it is also a, just one of those quirky cases of the fossil record where really the only time you have to ask is this cannibalism or parenthood right <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> And sometimes it's cannibalism. Yep. <laughs> we have found that. Oh, there yeah. There are examples in the fossil record of animals with digested remains of that same species. <laughs> just smaller. <laughs> just smaller. We have at least one of those at the gray fossil site. Yeah. We, we have do. an alligator specimen that seems to have had gator remains inside of it. That does happen. Yep. But sometimes it's wholesome. Yes. 
Sometimes it's, <laughs> it's it's terrible, and sometimes it's wholesome, and sometimes it was wholesome, and then the animal passed away. Yes. And you remember that's all right, that's actually not so wholesome. Yeah, yeah. No. Everything that's wholesome in the fossil <laughs> record is actually sad. It's actually sad. <laughs> So the fossil record is actually full of examples of live bearing fossil animals, including lots of groups we don't have today, ichthyosaurs, mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, which only adds to the list of the number of times that viviparity has evolved. Oh, yeah. Add those to the list that I said earlier. At least once in plesiosaurs, at least once in ichthyosaurs, there's a bunch. Well, and looking at like squamates where we see groups that seemingly might have gone back and forth mm-hmm. who knows how many times have happened throughout the fossil history of squamates right like it, innumerable times they 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 just get to pick and choose yes <laughs> this brings us back around to the question of patterns of evolution in viviparity this has been discussed a bunch so i'm just going to pick a couple of different examples that i've seen discussed numerous times One of which is something you may, listeners, have already picked up on if you noticed that basically every amnio that I just listed is an aquatic species. Yeah, they swim. They swim. This is something that we see today. It is very common for secondarily aquatic reptiles and mammals, of course, to give live birth. Yes. Of course, all secondarily aquatic mammals today give live birth. But also, like, sea snakes tend to give live birth. It's common for animals to give live birth when they move back into the ocean. Because, as you mentioned, if you're laying a shelled egg, it needs to be laid on land. We talked about this in episode 92 about eggs. That kind of egg, an amniotic egg, can't be underwater. Yeah. The shell does not work with gas exchange in a liquid. Fish can do it. Mm -hmm. Amphibians can do it. Us amniotes, reptiles and mammals, cannot do that. Nope. So sea turtles and you know marine iguanas have to come back onto land to lay eggs whenever they want to reproduce. Mm-hmm. But if an animal's actually shaped like a fish, then it's not going to be as easy for them, potentially impossible yeah. for them to climb back on land. Yeah. Some sea snakes, for example, or whales, cannot maneuver on land. Exactly. And like ichthyosaurs are are shaped like a torpedo. <laughs> yes, we have evidence that mosasaurs, ichthyosaurs, and plesiosaurs, three separate groups that went back to the water, all were giving live birth. Mm-hmm. There's also some examples from other groups. So like metriorhynchid crocs, which are croc cousins that were uh, aqua- like fully out in the ocean aquatic. Mm-hmm. I've seen some reference to studies that have observed the shape of their hips might be a hint that they were also giving live birth. I don't think we found pregnant uh, aquatic crocs, but the hips might have might be an indication that that's what we're seeing, which we would expect because that's what reptiles do when they move back to the water. Yeah. And there's definitely the chance because like if one were to look at a sea turtle, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't expect that they could come back onto the beach. Right. It, It is not intuitive that that animal can still come back to land. Right. So it may be that there were some of these marine reptiles that actually could drag themselves up on the beach, and we just haven't been able to picture that in our heads. Sure. But we do have repeated evidence mm-hmm. that they were repeatedly evolving live birth. And a lot of them really don't seem like they were yes. <laughs> built to come back on <laughs> land anymore. Now, this has actually been the subject of some discussion because there is this classic view that if a lineage of animals evolves back towards the water, toward aquatic habitats, live birth is liable to develop because of all of these benefits, all of the difficulties of trying to lay an amniotic egg in the ocean. Mm-hmm. But there is some evidence, which we've discussed before, I think we discussed this in the Ichthyosaurs episode, there is evidence to make us reconsider the order of events there. Mm-hmm. And the evidence has to do with the position of the embryos. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When we think of giving live birth, we humans, to use a very human example, the newborn is supposed to come out in a particular order, (laughs) supposed to be head first. That's true of a lot of animals that give live birth, mammals in particular. Offspring comes out head first. Uh, As we well know in humans, if the birth isn't head first, it can lead to complications and problems. It can be very dangerous, potentially. 
a lot of live bearing animals today, particularly reptiles, will sometimes the, the embryos will be curled up so they can come out in different postures. But aquatic live bearing animals, especially when we look at mammals and reptiles, often give birth tail first. Mm-hmm. And this is another one of those beneficial things. If the offspring comes out tail first, the head is enclosed until the whole body is out, which is important because that newborn now has to take a breath. Yes. If you're looking at an air-breathing animal that's returned to the water. Yep, mammals, reptiles. That baby will drown, potentially, in the yes. time it takes it to be born if it, it starts head first. Yes. So aquatic viviparous animals, especially mammals and reptiles, tend to give birth tail first instead. We see this in the fossil record in ichthyosaurs. It's been proposed that that's what we're seeing in mosasaurs, that this is something that has also convergently developed. But there are numerous cases in ichthyosaurs and in the plesiosaur lineage where we have early members of the group with gravid or pregnant fossils that show a head-first posture of the embryo that is about to be born. The Chauhusaurus is one of those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is a little bit surprising to find animals that are already adapted for aquatic habits, but are giving birth head first. And this has been suggested to support the idea that live birth evolved while they were on land. Yeah. That they didn't move into the water and then give up giving eggs. Their ancestors had already developed live birth which predisposed them for being able to adapt to aquatic habitats. They already didn't have to worry about the eggs, so they already came prepared to overcome one of the challenges of moving into the water. Which means you wouldn't have a phase or early lineage of ichthyosaurs, for example, that were behaving like sea turtles. Right, coming back on land to lay eggs. Yeah, that wouldn't that just wouldn't have happened in this evolutionary lineage because they were right. already giving live birth, so they just walked right into the ocean. <laughs> Which might explain partly why so many aquatic reptile lineages are live bearing when we know it's possible to not be. Yes. You can be a sea turtle. They've been around for a long time. And you can return to land and, and lay eggs again. It might not be that Every time it happens, that lineage must evolve away from eggs, but that the land-dwelling lineages that don't lay eggs are more likely to evolve secondarily aquatic lineages. Yeah, they're prepped for that lifestyle already. Which also brings to my mind of if they were already swimming-shaped, but giving birth face-first, were they having to, like, go to shallows and, like... Yeah, I don't know. Like partially beach themselves or something so that the baby could come out be able to start taking a breath in or i wonder if they might have adaptations to make the birth happen faster mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that there is less of a chance of the offspring getting stuck on the way out or yeah. it, or it being a slow process or that there's ways to make sure that the the juveniles like doesn't take a breath until yeah, yeah. it is fully birthed and then can, like, yeah, how are you doing it if you're yeah. already fish-shaped? <laughs> this uh, topic spawns off into a whole bunch of other interesting questions. I came across one paper that was discussing the importance of genetic sex determination in aquatic animals. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So a lot of reptiles, particularly egg-laying reptiles, the sex of the embryos is determined by the temperature. Yep. We see that in turtles, we see that in crocs, which is harder to achieve if an animal's giving birth in the ocean, Mm -hmm. and harder to achieve in viviparous animals, Mm -hmm. where the temperature is going to be the same as the body. So that paper was discussing what is the role of evolving genetic sex determination before they could evolve viviparity, which they might have needed before they could have evolved aquatic lifestyle. There's all sorts of cool questions that go into how do you make this work? as a lifestyle regarding reproduction. Yeah, it gets surprisingly complicated as you go through all of the features and determining factors of birth. Yeah. Speaking of environmental conditions, there is one other correlation that I want to make mention of when we see viviparity evolution, and that is the suggestion of a link between live bearing and climates. Hmm. 
Hmm. This has also been discussed a whole bunch in the literature. The idea is that if an animal lives in a colder environment, viviparity might be extra beneficial because now there's no worry about leaving eggs out in the cold. The embryos develop inside the body, which has to be warm anyway. That was my like, first what? thought about the alpine salamander. Yep. <laughs> and that's one of the examples that's suggested. Yeah, this is a mountain-dwelling salamander. Is that one of the selective pressures that maybe leads towards viviparous evolution? This has been studied quite a bit. Actually, there's been numerous studies that have tried to look at this. And unsurprisingly, they use squamates. <laughs> lizards and snakes because if you want to study patterns in when egg laying versus live bearing seem to show up lizards and snakes are such a phenomenal resource you go to the masters you, yeah, absolutely <laughs> and you say well please tell us all your secrets but yeah because you can say all right let's i found one study that looked at a genus <laughs> of lizards one genus and went all right which species give live birth and which species lay eggs and is there a correlation yeah no this would be enough because <laughs> you can do that and there have been a number of studies that have found correlation in lizards and snakes with live bearing species being found at higher latitudes so farther north or further south and higher altitudes higher up on mountains and such this of course makes sense for the reasons that we suggested but it is not a perfect correlation there have been other studies that have countered this idea. One of them was that Mesolophus study, the fossil snake that I just mentioned. Those authors point out that environment was is interpreted as a very warm climate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that doesn't seem to be the whole story. One of the studies that I read also pointed out that they did this analysis. They found that live bearing was more common in colder climates but also that live bearing within the lizards they studied was more common in the tropics. Yeah. They found a correlation with both. Yep. Yeah. Which is weird. Now, their explanation was what that might be reflecting is that it's relatively common in tropical parts of the world to find species that have specialized in high altitude areas where it is colder, which then might return to the more tropical warmer areas mm -hmm. that these might be secondary what they they called it secondary invasions yes that you have specialists that evolve live birth and then they take off with this wonderful strategy they've come upon and end up moving back into areas where we wouldn't expect it as much into warmer or wetter areas or whatnot it's also important to keep in mind that all of the discussion that i just said is about lizards and snakes yep so not only might that not be universal across that group there's every chance it's not universal across all groups mm -hmm. i've seen i've seen discussion about early mammals and that one of the reasons that viviparity might have evolved early on was because of the lifestyle of small mammals in the mesozoic that viviparity may have allowed them to uh, i think the suggestion was that viviparity may have been better for them being small mm -hmm. they don't mm -hmm. have to produce eggs I saw one study on snails that pointed out that in land snails, viviparity seems to correlate with certain habitats, but not necessarily the temperature, but habitats where weather patterns are less predictable or where they may be more exposed, like rocky environments, harsh conditions, essentially, that viviparity in snails might also correlate to habitat, but maybe for different reasons. Mm -hmm. This is one of those examples where it's very difficult to find a correlation because of how widespread and diverse and variable live bearing is as a reproductive habit well and also how diverse and different the benefits and costs are mm -hmm. there are many reasons a species could benefit from developing live birth some of which are quite different from one another yes <laughs> like not all of the benefits are in a similar category yeah. So what drives one group to develop live birth could be completely different from what drives another group to develop live birth or to not develop it. The costs are also... Absolutely. So... Or to go back, yeah. apparently. So it not only makes sense that you could have differences between groups, but even within lineages, 
Are you living somewhere where this benefit is good? All right, then develop live birth. Are you living somewhere where a completely di different benefit is beneficial? Then develop live birth. So it is, it makes sense that it is hard to nail down a uh, or a few trends. Yes, this kind of topic, this is, this is a fascinating topic. It's one of those where there are several avenues for further discussion, which we won't get into today because the episode is over. <laughs> uh, but th what a cool concept for something that we think of as being so intrinsic and important and sometimes so rigid. Mm -hmm. that, like, I, I think that it's very intuitive to think that you can only mess with reproductive bi biology so much yeah. before things start going horribly wrong and evolution that's a that's a dead dead end lineage well yeah it seems like for such a crucial part of the life cycle yeah. the next generation and whatnot that any tampering mm -hmm. would have it almost immediate ill side effects but <laughs> and yet there's so much tampering yeah there are like i said there's tons more to go into here there's all sorts of cool conversations to be had about the ways, even more specifically, that embryos are nourished, the ways that embryos develop. There is active study going on, looking at evolutionary patterns of live birth. I'm sure there are animals living and extinct that I haven't mentioned. Oh, yeah. That are someone's favorite. If I didn't mention your favorite live bearing animal, please go ahead and leave a comment. Let us know. <laughs> For me, it would be my mom, I think. Right. <laughs> Everyone send us pictures, <laughs> photos of your mom. Uh, <laughs> if you'd like to learn more about this kind of subject, number one, uh, episode 92, eggs. Mm -hmm. Go check that out. We also did an episode on ontogeny, episode 33, the development of organisms over the course of the life. We've touched on similar topics over time. And if you'd like us to touch on more similar topics, send us episode topic requests any ways that you can think to get in touch with us absolutely this is a super cool discussion i've had a lot of fun i don't want to stop having this discussion but we <laughs> do have to end the episodes eventually and there is a thing that we have to do still before we wrap up the episode and that is our patron question one of the benefits that our patrons can get on patreon is the ability to ask us questions for us to answer here on the podcast now quick mention one of our patrons richard did send us the question how many times has live birth evolved and how do different types of live birth work which fortunately we always did a whole episode about that there you go richard so check that question off the list will what other patron question do we have today we have a question from jackie who asks from the plate tectonics episode i learned the oldest ocean crust is younger than eoraptor how is it that we have ocean fossils from back to the Cambrian? Are there just tiny bits of ocean crust that collided with continental plates, and that's the scraps we have left? How many places on Earth preserve deep oceans of the past? This is a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, we did talk a bunch about this in the Deep Sea episode, episode 128, where we discussed some of the ways we get evidence from especially deep oceans of the past. One of the things that I like about this question is Jackie says, are there just tiny bits of crust that crash into continents and get stuck? And the answer is, yeah, yep, that absolutely happens. Uh, this is called accretion, mm -hmm. where when plates are coming together during subduction, especially when oceanic crust is sinking underneath a slab of continental crust, chunks of the ocean crust can get caught on the continent. Yep, scraped off. And stick there. This will often happen with like, sea mounts and islands will crash into the continent and become accreted onto them but it can also be deeper portions of oceanic crust which leaves chunks of it, of ocean crust relatively available for us to get access to them <laughs> in, in the sense that they did not sink down into the mantle and <laughs> get recycled yes <laughs> but also the other way we get deep ocean sediments available for us to study is uh, mountain building mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Orogeny, when continent and ocean crust come together, they tend to form mountains. Or when two continents come together over a basin that's closing, the smushing of the crust tends to force parts of the crust up into mountain ranges, and that can drag up ocean sediments. So 
here in East Tennessee, in the mountains, we are surrounded by limestone, which is shallow ocean sediment, which was dragged up here during mountain building. You can also get geologic sequences that are called ophiolites. I forgot that word. I had to ask our friend Laura. I was like, Laura, what's that? What's it called when the ocean crust is dragged up and it's a rock? And Laura remembered it's called ophiolites. Ophiolites are sequences of rocks that often will include marine sediments. So that could be limestones and shales. So the, the mud at the bottom that has fossils in it can also just be chunks of ocean crust, like the basaltic rock of the crust. And sometimes ophiolites will also include chunks of the upper mantle. Wow. That get pulled up along with the rest of it. So just a whole chunk of ocean crust, top to bottom, gets dragged up, often in mountain building events, toward the surface where we geologists can examine them. That's intense. Yeah. Ophiolites. (laughs) O-P-H-I-O-L-I-T-E. I think this is a, a great example of, I don't know, one of the things I still find tricky every now and then, thinking about paleontology and fossil sites, is that you have to constantly remind yourself that where we're finding the fossils now and what environment that fossil site was don't have to sync up with where they are or where they were or what it is now. Nope. At all. So that's, (laughs) you can find an island ecosystem that is not on an island anymore. No. Because that island got smushed into the mainland at some point. And oceans on mountains. Mm -hmm. So with all that in mind, going back to Jackie's question... Yeah, ocean crust gets recycled. So the ocean crust on our modern day planet doesn't get older than the Jurassic or so because anything older than that has been recycled. But these accreted chunks or these uplifted chunks can be basically saved from doom. Airlifted. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) Pulled out of the path of demise. (laughs) Up onto the surface. And in mountains, it's great because those then get eroded away and it exposes those fantastic ocean rocks. Uh, Jackie also asked how common are rocks and fossils from deep sea ecosystems. Not super common, Mm -mm. but we do get them. Uh, There are examples of deep sea sediments. There are examples of hydrothermal vent environments fossilized uh, back billions of years old. Uh, Again, we did an episode about the deep sea where we talked about some of that more often. But in short, Yes, continents can hoover up (laughs) chunks of ocean crust and ocean sediment for us to examine, which is how we learn about oceans older than the oldest current ocean crust. Yes. Snapshots. Thank you for that question, Jackie. Thank you to all of our patrons. Thank you to everyone who requested this fascinating episode topic for this fascinating episode. Thank you to everybody who listens. Thank you to you. I mean you, dear listener, listening right now. That's right. We really appreciate it. We encourage you to get in touch with us. Join the Discord. Follow us on social media. Send us your episode requests. Support us on Patreon if you are so inclined. We'd love to have your participation and support. Check out the blog post after this episode for links and pictures, for more information. All of that stuff is linked down in the episode description. Uh, You can give us one-time donations. You can join Audible and read books. I'm sure there's books on Audible about placentas and live (laughs) birth and the evolution of aquatic reptiles. Find those on Audible. Follow our link and you'll support us and also get yourself some books. There's all sorts of cool things you can do to interact with our brand. (laughs) (laughs) And we are at the time of year where you can interact more directly than usual and ask us questions that we will directly answer on the end of the year Q&A. The submission form as of the release of this episode is open only for a few more days. December 15th is when it closes, so get your question in now if you haven't already. There is only one episode left for this year of 2022, episode 155, which is our Alley episode, last Alley episode of the year, comes out on Christmas. Yay! And we asked earlier in the year when we realized that the schedule falls that way for our listeners to suggest potential Christmas themed topics for the episode. And we picked one and we've already recorded it. Yes. Uh, That's already done. It's awesome. Yeah. We're going to have a great time. So join us on December 25th when that episode comes out uh, for one more episode for the year. We'll talk about Christmassy stuff. (laughs) And then one massive recording as we answer all your questions at the very end. (laughs) Very end of the year, end of the year Q and a, that'll be it. Thank you all for sticking with us for another year of podcasting. 
We release episodes every fortnight. One fortnight from now is Christmas. And then the next fortnight is 2023. Woo! We'll be in a whole new year. So we'll see you then. Sign off phrase. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.